Hi, all. Welcome to the final Thursday seminar of 2020 here in December. I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Marlowe and hear from him. But first, we'll hear an intro from our own co-director, Pete Gerges, who nominated Dr. Marlowe to give the talk today. We'll pick back up on our talks in January 2021, and be sure to watch your inbox for information on that, as well as the MSI website. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pete. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope you are all having a wonderful uh, day today. Uh, and it is really my great pleasure uh, to be introducing Jeff. Let me just go ahead and share my screen here. Well, getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, all right, let's see. Um, oh, computer's not behaving as planned. So we're just going to go ahead and, and wing this. Here, we'll do, it we'll do it old school. All right, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Marlowe. Uh, Jeff Hales from Denver, Colorado. Uh, and for his undergraduate, he went to Washington University in St. Louis, where uh, he, I think, that's, I believe, where his interest in geobiology was first kindled. After that, for his doctoral work, uh, he headed to Caltech, where he worked with Professor Victoria Orphan, uh, studying methane oxidizing microbes uh, at seafloor methane seeps. Upon finishing his doctoral work, he came here to Harvard University, and I had the great pleasure of working with Jeff. He came to work with us in the lab, uh, where he led several really exciting projects, uh, including the development of a novel approach for mapping microbial communities in salt marsh sediments. And it's a method that allows Jeff to reveal, uh, to observe the connections uh, between metabolic activity and the mineralogy of the surrounding sediments. And it holds a lot of promise for really being able to hone in on these sort of microbial neighborhoods and sediments to understand who's working with whom uh, and to understand the environment in which microbes are most active. Now, Jeff is also an accomplished science writer, and his writings can be found in Wired Magazine, uh, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. He's also the executive director of the Ad Astra Academy. It's an educational organization that shares the inspirational power of exploration with students around the world. Now, I wanted to share a few fun facts with you all. Uh, Jeff is uh, a gentleman, as you can see in this dapper picture here. Uh, he is, of course, a scholar. Uh, but he is also uh, maybe a bit of a Trekkie and, and definitely a tea uh, aficionado. Um, Jeff and I have shared many wonderful cups of tea, and uh, it's always um, it's always a pleasure to learn from from Jeff uh, and to to spend time with him. And this this picture of him tickles me. I think I'm going to try and um, see if I can make this meme go viral. It's just perfect. But all of that sort of silliness aside. Um, uh, well, actually, no, not done with the silliness. I take it back. Jeff is also very well traveled. And while he was in the lab, we loved hearing tales of his many trips. And, and for his going away party, we thought we'd put together a kind of uh, where's Marlowe map. Uh, and, you know, we thought we were being really clever. I thought I was being really clever. And so I asked Jeff to provide, if he didn't mind, a list of everywhere he'd been. And um, I was, I was utterly overwhelmed. Boy, was I wrong. I had just not a chance in the world of putting enough um, uh, Where's Marlowe icons on here because Jeff really has been to many places uh, and done many extraordinary things. And I hope some of you will ask him about those. But now, silliness aside, it really has been a great pleasure to work with Jeff and get to see just what a brilliant scholar he is. Uh, what a caring uh, and thoughtful collaborator he is. And most importantly, he's just a wonderful human being. So I'm thrilled uh, that we have the opportunity to hear from him today. And I'm thrilled that he's staying in the Boston area for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I should also note that I gather that the Marlow Lab has openings. So if you are looking for a position, check out his website. Uh, you won't regret it. That's, well, I, without any further ado, that's what I got. And I'd love to turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, the screen is yours. All right, well, thank you so much. That was a very, very generous introduction. And um, I'm excited to share some of the um, science I had the pleasure of doing as a member of Pete's lab. Um, and hopefully give an idea of some of the directions that I hope to continue moving in as I um, start this new adventure, building my lab at Boston University. Um, 
And we do get to go on a little journey today to one of those uh, exciting places I had a, a chance to go. Um, and we're going to do that kind of through a um, three part three part talk here. So I'm going to present the kind of um, philosophical underpinnings of this method that we've been trying to develop to really see these microbial neighborhoods through the lens of microbial activity. Um, and then spotlight the two distinct um, case studies where we've deployed this method so far. So we're going to start with this, uh, you know, very small inconsequential question of uh, how microbes shape the earth. You know, this is the, the main force behind much of our work and through, you know, the MSI, people are attacking this question some, from so many different directions. But in kind of the geology and geobiology worlds, we are frequently presented with these grand pronouncements of how cycles are mediated by microbes. We might see, you know, these big diagrams like this, where we have carbon going across hundreds of kilometers and thousands of meters of depth and from the ocean to the land to the atmosphere, or the nitrogen cycle, or getting a little bit more targeted to something like the uh, sulfur cycle in sediments. So these are very useful ways of kind of thinking about the emergent properties of microbial communities. But to me, the question is kind of what scale are these individual organisms operating on? And how do these arrows that are so easily drawn and inferred through um, omics methods frequently, how are those actually manifesting on the micro scale between individual organisms? So the central kind of unit that we can start to think about this with is the microbial community. These are um, sort of scope independent. They can be anything that we're talking about from a few microns across a few different individuals to you know, a, a larger population, but they're made up of um, individual cells and individual biomolecules inside of those cells. So the actual um, molecules doing much of this biochemistry are on the nanoscale, cells often a micron across, the community is larger, and then those communities influence larger and larger domains from animals through kind of microbiomes to larger ecosystems, regional fluxes, uh, and ultimately global atmospheres or elemental cycles. So from these enzymes to the planet as a whole, we're talking about 17 different order orders of magnitude spatially. And thinking about how these metabolic activities kind of propagate across these spatial scales is a huge challenge. The top-down and bottom-up calculations rarely actually meet and this kind of mesoscale, starting with the microbial community, is perhaps a promising way to bridge that divide. The other kind of um, philosophical entry point into this uh, type of work is the two, the central questions of microbial ecology. Who's there and what are they doing? These are um, you know, typically considered two questions that bound the space of what microbes mean in a given ecosystem. Um, but to me, these are actually three different questions. Uh, most people, I feel like, approach that first one largely focusing on the who. These are frequently, um, you know, metaomics projects that are very comprehensive, but they tend to degrade the spatial um, information. The there component of this question is more about that spatial relationship. And we're going to talk a lot about that um, for the rest of the talk. And then, of course, what are they doing? Um, so the traditional ways of addressing these two questions, again, sort of leave a little something to be desired. There's a comprehensive way of looking at the whole metabolic potential of a given ecosystem. Uh, through metagenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, um, and then the kind of more spatially um, aware aspects frequently through microscopy. Um, but that is almost by definition 
a limiting scope. So again, how are we going to bridge these gaps to address these three questions and across multiple spatial scales? And a question that I'm uh, that's very related to this, but tackles it from a slightly different way, um, is thinking about what a given organism's sphere of influence really is. There are all kinds of things that could change this, the metabolism, the environment, ecosystem, season, the neighbors around it, um, all kinds of variables at play. But how does, say, for a methanogen, a given methane molecule um, move once it is emitted? Um, it could be consumed very locally by microbial partners, could be processed abiotically, photochemically, could get into the atmosphere and circle the globe. What is the kind of probability distribution um, that allows us to connect what an individual organism is doing on this scale with these large biogeochemical cycles that we often um, try to abstract? And these spatial relationships have been shown time and again to be very, very important. Um, I'm just going to touch on a very small subset of studies that have shown this kind of through the cultured and modeling approach on this slide. Um, studies have shown that things like nutrient limitation can promote the mixing of different organisms as they grow outward from a, from a surface. Um, and that these dependent intercell intercellular interactions um, are frequently limited by space and they're limited to a few cell lengths and distance when these communities are particularly dense. From a more ecological perspective, many types of syntrophies have been found. Um, this is one that we will touch on a little bit later um, where there are purple sulfur bacteria that are um, generating sulfate phototrophically from sulfide and sulfate reducing bacteria um, live in these huge clumps of many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of cells um, to kind of create this syntrophic, these pink berries um, at salt marshes. So this whole, you know, these different threads of thoughts and, and methodological needs for the community have crystallized around this idea of making maps of microbial activity um, across several orders of magnitude of spatial scale, starting at the micro scale and the single cell um, resolution. And this is a sort of uh, diptych, I guess, of uh, two end members of the way of looking at um, biodiversity, I think, on our planet. One is what's kind of more traditional, a lush rainforest with, I don't know, dozens of species shown in this image. Another is a um, grain of sand that was published a couple of years ago, where the green is a general DNA stain showing all of the microbes on this grain of sand, accounting for more than uh, a few hundred individual different species on a single grain of sand. So biodiversity scales in remarkable ways, and these microenvironments in our soils, in rocks, uh, in any substrate really, um, is enormous and untapped. So this, this image here on the right is kind of just who's there, um, not even who, but what type of micro, what microbes are around. Um, and the, the, um, in order to get more at the who of that question, a lot of fluorescence in situ hybridization work has been moved forward recently that can multiplex the probes to identify many different lineages while maintaining spatial scale. And this has mostly been done in microbiomes. Um, this uh, classy fish approach at the human oral microbiome and a recent um, highly multiplexed approach in mouse guts. These are fish probes. So they're telling us what type of microbe is around but not really telling us much about metabolic activity. Um, and in some ways, the, the next step of that is something like the um, spatial metabolome that's looking at you know, not only who's there with fish probes, but also um, what sort of biomolecules are being produced and perhaps transferred between different species. So um, these are kind of some of the approaches that can address these questions while maintaining the spatial arrangements of the constituents. Here's the type of work that um, 
that I've been trying to tackle over the last few years um, by addressing these three questions in the ways I've listed here. So um, we're trying to get at the who through um, fluorescence activated cell sorting and 16S sequencing. The spatial component of there uh, is what I'll focus on a lot of today. That was kind of the, the method I was trying to develop of incubating um, some of these microbiomes in their native environments, embedding them in resin to maintain the spatial arrangement, and then looking at metabolic activity through um, BONCAT, this approach that uses substrate analogs, artificial amino acids to um, see who's building proteins. And this is the heart of that approach. Um, the idea is that HPG is a um, amino acid analog that substitutes in for methionine about one out of every 500 times that a protein needs a methionine. As a result, um, the, you can then do some click chemistry at the back end of this process to get a fluorescent dye onto these HPG molecules that have been incorporated into peptides. And the cells that have incorporated these HPG molecules then glow. Um, this is an example of kind of how this all works with a DAPI general DNA stain, um, the BONCAT here in green in this case, a given fish probe. Um, and you can kind of see that this allows us to see which organisms are kind of differentially active within um, a clump of organisms. Importantly, this BONCAT approach does not appear to really change the metabolism of the organisms being studied. Um, this was using uh, methane seep um, aggregates where the amount of sulfide produced when methane was added didn't really change uh, when different concentrations of HPG were added. That's kind of a bulk effect that um, gives us confidence that we're not drastically changing the overall activity of these communities. And to be a little bit more uh, precise about that, a full metabolome of E. coli was recently studied to see how different types of these amino acid analogs, uh, here we're using HPG in particular, how that shapes out in terms of the abundance of different um, metabolites. So the takeaway from this, this heat map is that the same sort of molecule don't tend to clump and form massively different uh, metabolomes. So that's kind of helping us address this, what are they doing question. Back to the question of spatial arrangement. Um, other sort of aspects of the, the toolbox are looking at the pore network through uh, micro CT scanning, looking at the texture through electron microscopy and addressing what the minerals are. Uh, this is a key thing that hasn't really been incorporated into any of those um, sort of multiplexed fish approaches I was showing you earlier. Um, but in this kind of geobiological sense, it's really important to see how different organisms interact with the minerals around them, which I will hopefully convince you of as we get to some data. And then there's, you know, we can, we don't need to lose sight of the identity aspects of this. Um, so we're going to address the who's there question, both through overall biomass, but ultimately uh, cell sorting to see which of the microbes that have incorporated this HPG molecule um, and which ones have not. So we can kind of separate the active community from the inactive and see how that sorts out. All right, so this whole um, quest has kind of crystallized into a workflow like this. I'm gonna outline it here and then we'll get into some, uh, some examples of how this was deployed in a couple different sites. So these kind of mini cores were developed, um, plastic that was uh, had low permeability so that these sort of anoxic zones of sediment once collected would not um, oxidize when transferred um, to the lab. So we would go and collect sediments, add in the HPG, that artificial amino acid, um, allow the sediment to incubate in situ while incorporating that HPG in the presence of all of the environmental characteristics that are important. Um, 
temperature is going to be the same, the gas flux we used, these membranes that were gas permeable, liquid impermeable, so we could keep the um, HPG in um, solution, but also get the kind of connectivity that's really important between different sediment layers. After a predetermined amount of time, we would go back, pick up these mini cores of sediment, fix them, embed them in resin, and then go to our kind of analytical pipeline of micro CT scanning, sectioning, and correlative uh, fluorescence and electron microscopy. All right, let's uh, go do some science with this approach. So the first kind of pilot study I'm gonna talk about is um, this active volcano on the island of Vanuatu. And I had the pleasure of, of going here a couple of years ago, um, along with my colleague, Jens Kallmeier. And we were really interested in what is going on in this most bizarre of geochemical and geological environments. This is Ambrim Island. Uh, it's in the South Pacific, uh, sort of between Papua New Guinea and Fiji, um, one of the many islands of Vanuatu. And you can kind of see that the outside is beautiful tropical rainforest, but as you get interior, you get to the um, volcanic spots that are much more active. And um, ultimately at the very surface, at the very top of this, you're kind of surrounded by this constant um, vog of uh, emissions. And at the bottom of the crater is this active lava lake that is just constantly churning, constantly erupting um, and producing some really unusual um, types of chemistry that are bathing the insides of this crater. So there are, this is an example of just a handful of lava lakes in the world. It actually no longer exists. Uh, about a year ago, it sort of drained uh, for mysterious reasons. So that one's off the list, but there does seem to be another one kind of down here in the South Sandwich Islands. So at any given time, there are maybe six to eight lava lakes in the world. These are just um, constantly erupting um, sort of steady state emissions of heat and regeneration of kind of heat and energetic flux from below um, that are still kind of a mystery as to how exactly they sustain themselves. Um, this one in Ambrim Island had been going for maybe 20 years, meaning that the gases it was pumping out would kind of create this really unusual yet stable environment for microbes to potentially inhabit. And these are the stats that really blow me away. This is from a relatively recent study um, of the emissions coming out of this one volcanic complex that accounts for huge proportions of major um, gases. So five to 9% of the world's volcanic emissions of um, water vapor, CO2, HCl, all these other things, even higher proportions of SO2, hydrofluoric, hydrofluoric acid, and more than 30% of some of these metals. So um, you know, there's a lot of microbiology to be done here that I'm not going to talk about today because we haven't done it yet. Uh, but I am excited to see what kind of um, adaptations could exist for these really unusual conditions. But what we were doing was incubating the ephemeral um, with this HPG solution. So we um, sort of incubated some of the sediment for 24 hours with 50 micromolar HPG that was dissolved in the filtered condensed steam coming out of this fumarole, um, and then proceeded along the lines of that, that pipeline I showed you earlier. And this is the kind of thing we see. So this is just one uh, small field of view of this section, which is actually larger, I'll show you in a moment. But for this field of view, this is a sense of what we're seeing. So cyber is a general DNA stain. Um, so here we're seeing all of the biomass in this field of view, and red is what is um, anabolically active. So if I just briefly kind of toggle between these, you can see that most of the biomass here is active in this particular uh, field of view. We were able to extend this uh, sort of um, transverse cut down into the sediment about two centimeters. And through that process, we crossed um, three different types of minerals, silica, anorthite, and augite. Um, and overall, we got some of these kind of generalized numbers of what's happening, got a good sense of how um, abundance and activity move along this gradient. So overall, the cell abundance was five times 10 to the eighth. That's 
um, relatively high perhaps for an active femoral in this bizarre environment, but consistent with what you might imagine in a given soil. About 30% of these cells were meta anabolically active. Um, and interestingly, back to that kind of idea of the sphere of influence of a given organism, they clump with cells of like activity. Um, so for 77% of the active ones, its nearest neighbor was active. And that corresponding number for lack of activity was 88.6%. We can also track um, in kind of a moving field of view, the overall abundance and normalize that per surface area and volume of the mineral grains. And overall, um, there is a pretty uh, pronounced decrease in abundance as we go down into the sediment. We can also look at what's happening with the anabolic activity of those microbes. And in general, it is increasing as we go down into the sediment. That's shown here in red. So, what we think is sort of happening here is that at the top, you have a lot of environmental variability, um, but you also have a lot of colonization potential. So this is probably where runoff is coming in, or you can have dry deposition from um, sort of the constantly swirling winds around the top of this crater, introducing a lot of biomass, but because the environment is so variable, it can rain, um, the fumarole could sort of turn on or off, uh, wind might blow stuff back into the femoral rather than out. Uh, so at any given time, a larger proportion of the community is not going to be happy. Whereas as you go down into the uh, sediment, that changes. Things get a little bit more stable, perhaps. We also saw something similar when you moved inside a mineral grain itself. So here we're plotting um, from the, you know, this is the surface of a given mineral. The orange is the proportion of all the organisms that we found binned by, I think, 25 micron bins. And then the blue is the proportion of that kind of orange peak that's active. So you can see there are fewer cells as you get further inside mineral grains, but on balance, they are more likely to be anabolically active. We also did a um, community survey. Um, I'll kind of breeze over this in the interest of time, but um, we did see a, that the, the constraining factor perhaps appears to be nitrogen. The archaeal community, 33% of all the sequences were these Tom archaea, uh, which are usually ammonia oxidizers. They colonize caves early on in the kind of um, uh, process of, of cave rock deformation. Um, and at an acidic site like this, they can have challenges because uh, ammonia can turn into ammonium, uh, which is less accessible by ammonia oxidizers. But there's kind of a workaround where chloroflexi can use urea, uh, turn that into ammonia and make the tomarchia happier. So this is a kind of proposed um, symbiosis that we think could be going on here. Something similar has been shown at um, geothermal sites from Antarctica to Hawaii. All right, so that's kind of the, the first use of this approach, um, relatively modest in its ambitions, uh, but nonetheless able to show that there are actively growing organisms in these fumaroles and that we can see these remarkable spatial uh, relationships between depth, um, distance into sediment grains and dependence on different types of minerals. But what I'll spend the rest of the time on is the um, follow-up study. Um, and this was really the focus of the last couple of years that I was working with Pete. Um, and it was a, a project with um, the Hudson Picker Lab at Montana State University, and specifically uh, Dr. Rachel Speets, who is doing much of the um, sequencing that I'm going to present shortly. So we were doing this uh, study at Sipowis at Salt Marsh on Cape Cod. Salt marshes are great um, for a number of reasons, um, be, but for our case, it was ideal because there is so much going on in a small amount of space. This is because it really is where um, kind of land meets sea in the best of, of all possible ways, where you have a lot of organic input coming off of land masses, but you have sulfate from seawater that can kind of infiltrate 
um, in a tidal cycle, which gives you another electron acceptor and really increases the possibilities of different metabolisms that can co-occur. Um, there's also a lot of bioturbation at these, these pools in this marsh, um, allowing oxygen to kind of permeate and stir things up in interesting ways. Um, and because these pools are relatively shallow, uh, phototrophy is very much on the table. This is a uh, kind of cartoon of some of the metabolisms that we might imagine happening in compressed redox zones at salt marshes. And this is a um, nice image from a, um, a neighboring salt marsh, the Great Sipuisit Salt Marsh, where you can really see these layers sorting out in extremely nice ways. Um, so what was compelling about this location, um, at least from the perspective of our, our method development, was that we might see a lot of variation in a short amount of space. So we needed to customize the process to this location. Um, I'll breeze through a few of these, but we were just sort of optimizing the approach to make sure we knew what concentration of uh, HPG, this substrate analog we wanted, uh, and what concentration of dye, the answer was 50 and 5, respectively. Um, but then something else that we were pretty concerned about um, was the incubation time. We wanted to make sure we were capturing as much of the anabolic activity as we could get. Um, and we sort of did a time series experiment to see what proportion of the overall biomass would incorporate this um, HPG molecule and then tuned our incubation time accordingly. So we do see that it does essentially saturate. Um, so we wanted to get pretty close to that, but to potentially avoid cross-feeding effects, we hit the um, kind of end of this um, more rapid phase of anabolic growth. Uh, we ended up, I think at 88 hours. Um, so right around here was our incubation time. The last thing we needed to address before really diving in was how this process could influence the spatial arrangements um, in ways that we wouldn't really know. So we were concerned because we're adding in this solution with HPG, then we're gonna fix things with uh, paraformaldehyde, then we're gonna wash it out, um, add the resin. So a lot of fluid is moving through this core. Um, we were somewhat um, encouraged by the natural environment. This is a tidal marsh. So there are water levels that are going up and down on a tidal scale. Um, so, you know, that suggested that perhaps these communities were um, used to fluid flow and maybe wouldn't be massively transported by the slow dripping um, of, of fluid through our system that we would be doing. Um, but we wanted to make sure. So we did this bead test where we added um, a, a billion of these one micron fluorescent beads at the top of one of these cores and then treated it exactly as we were going to treat everything else and tried to track them uh, through microscopy. So here's what we saw at the um, kind of our control up at the top was that we didn't really see anything once it was embedded. Um, we saw a ton of these beads at two millimeters and less as we go down. If we plot these um, on a very simple graph, we see something like this, where with a simple interpolation, um, more than 99% of the beads remained above 7.6 millimeters. Uh, this number seems random now, but that is where we kind of had our first horizon that we looked at experimentally. Um, so we were pretty confident that what we were seeing was the native microbial community, um, that things would not be moved between layers and that we um, could kind of infer their relationships and activities accordingly. So here's that full process. Um, won't go through it again, but that's what happened. And these were the um, horizons that we looked at. So I just showed you the green arrows. Those were where we looked at the beads for this bead test. But then we had two parallel cores that we wanted to address these kind of um, these separate questions of, of the spatial arrangements and metabolic activity versus the um, microbial community and who was actually there in the first place. Um, so I'm going to talk about both of these, but this is just to kind of spatially orient what's going to be happening. 
Um, we're going to start with the 7.6 millimeter depth horizon. And um, well, even before we get there, this was kind of um, that micro CT scanning aspect where we can see the different pore spaces and mineral grains. This is taking a XY top down view, and we're kind of cutting, slicing down through the sediment um, to see how different mineral grains are packed, how pore spaces kind of move through. And um, interestingly, the brightness intensity through CT scanning is proportional to the atomic number. So um, we didn't use it in this case, but it could also be useful in terms of identifying the minerals. But ultimately we would kind of stop at one of these horizons, make the section. So this is at that 7.6 millimeter zone, do some microscopy. Um, and we needed to also make sure that the image processing um, would see all the organisms we wanted it to. I'll sort of skip the nitty gritty of that. Um, and um, make sure that we also knew what we were seeing in the Z direction to get actual abundances of microbes in a volumetric um, sense. And okay, so now we can get to kind of how we looked at the, the mineralogy and how the microbes interacted with that. This is one of those slices. If we zoom into a given area and then do um, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we can get a um, spectrum of what that area looks like. And we can get more specific in terms of the elements that we're interested in. So this was a map of aluminum, for example, potassium, sodium, oxygen, silicon. Um, several others were also incorporated into these maps, but um, you can sort of overlay those and correlate it with X-ray diffraction to get minerals based on those elemental abundances. And here is the kind of ultimate microbial map that we were able to produce. The background is just a um, SEM image to kind of show you the texture and where the, the mineral grains stop and start. Um, and the, here we've plotted blue. Light blue is going to be the general DNA stain. And yellow is the Boncat active uh, subset of that community. So we're gonna zoom into a few different grains in each of these horizons and then derive some kind of general findings from what we saw. First, if we zoom into this little zone, um, based on the XRD and the EDS mapping, this was a titanium oxide. So it's a grain of rutile. And we see in this upper left frame, this is all of the biomass. So that's the cyber stain in blue. Uh, the Boncat active subset um, here in yellow and the overlay. But in this case, we can see that pretty much everything in, in blue is also yellow. So a high proportion of the microbes associated with this rutile grain were anabolically active during our incubation. We can look at a couple of other different types of minerals. Here is um, plagioclase. This is a uh, different type of silicate with um, aluminum and sodium and calcium cations. And here, again, we see that the microbes like to inhabit the surface and that a large proportion of them are anabolically active. Moving along to a quartz grain, um, same kind of story. We're very interested in those surfaces, uh, perhaps a little bit less overall um, anabolic activity. And if we sort of take all of this, this data together and we map out where the different types of minerals are, here's what we can see. So here they've been kind of letter coded by the type of um, mineral we're looking at. And then here are those numbers in terms of the relative proportion of the microbes as a given distance from the outer surface that are anabolically active. So with these quartz grains, as we get right to that surface, and maybe in the, you know, the zone just outside that, um, that outer surface where we saw a lot of the microbes congregating, about half of them appear to be um, anabolically active. And then you can see that these proportions sort of change as we go down to these different mineral types. Um, I'm gonna summarize all this sort of stuff later, so don't worry too much about these specific numbers, um, just sort of orienting you to the type of data we're gonna stream through. Now for our second horizon, this is a 12 millimeter depth. Um, and 
this sort of darker gray zone is our, our footprint. You can see some zones of blue. Those are the um, all the cells we saw. Here you might notice that there's a lot more going on in these kind of particle, um, particulate assemblages. Um, and we're going to get onto those in just a moment. Here's a, another quartz grain. So we're seeing a fair amount of biomass on the outside here, but very few active cells. Here's one of those assemblages that's pretty heterogeneous uh, elementally, and we don't really you know, know what the precise combination is, um, but we see a fair amount of microbes and a decent proportion of abundant of, uh, of activity. And then another sort of plagioclase, orthoclase, um, uh, different types of cations incorporated into these silicate minerals. And here's the same kind of uh, proportionate abundance with this zone. And our final horizon, which was much deeper here at 60.7 millimeters of depth. Um, you're not gonna see as much because there was not as much there. Um, but a couple of zones we can kind of zoom in on our quartz grain and this plagioclase grain, um, not as much happening. All right, so in sort of bringing all of that um, spatial information and depth dependent activity information together, um, we can start to get a sense of what this microbiome is like as a function of depth. So on the left side of this table, I have the data I've just shown you from the microscopy where we have overall cell abundance and the proportion of those cells that uh, was active. It goes from about 50% in that top layer to 22 to 12 as we get farther down. So I also told you and haven't gone into too much detail yet, but there was a parallel core that was sequenced in 10 millimeter uh, horizons. And this was done after um, HPG incorporation and then through fluorescence activated cell sorting. So the cells that were growing and had incorporated that HPG could be um, sort of shunted into a different um, tube and sequenced separately. Um, but in terms of overall abundance of those um, fluorescently activated um, cells that were growing. We can also get a proportion of activity as a function of depth, and these match really, really well. Um, so um, I think the, uh, the top has slightly higher activity from the cell sorting, 70%. But as we go down in that second horizon, we're seeing 22 and 14 down at the very bottom. So this is kind of two ways of addressing the same question um, and they seem to support each other. All right, so now we're gonna walk through kind of the, the full incorporation of this data. Um, and with all minerals across um, really at that first depth, we can think about a few different parameters. First of all, the proportion that's active, that's what I just showed you, 51% here. Um, then we were kind of curious what, how microbes interact with surfaces. Do they prefer to be outside or can they sometimes um, be inside the poor spaces of the specific mineral grains? And what's the um, overall abundance of those? And is there a differential um, degree to which anabolic activity occurs, whether you're outside or inside these mineral grains? So in this case, um, when we looked at all the minerals of that top horizon, there wasn't much of a difference. The overall activity was 51%. If you were uh, outside a mineral grain, it was 51.7. Um, and if you were inside, um, it would be 50, almost 53%. But as we look, as we separate this out by different types of minerals, um, we see some differences. So um, I guess the most important things to be looking at at the moment are these numbers. So the proportion of the biomass outside these mineral grains that was anabolically active um, was substantially higher in non-quartz grains. So these again are minerals that have um, uh, monovalent or divalent cations uh, and can potentially be a little bit more uh, metabolically involved. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, and particularly this rutile grain. So we only had one of them, so um, can't say anything too conclusive, um, but the vast majority of the cells that were around the outside of that mineral grain were anabolically active. And then we can kind of do the same thing for these two different, two other uh, horizons. And 
one of the takeaways I've just written out here, which is that as we go down into this sediment, um, you have a higher proportion of cells that are inside mineral grains and a higher proportion of those um, are likely to be anabolically active. So in this top layer, the cells that were inside minerals were 2.1% more likely to be active. As we went down, that differential kind of increased to a 24% and then a 45% increase. And if we think back to what happened on the volcano, these are similar stories, where as we both as we go down into a sediment horizon and as we go inside mineral grains, the um, overall abundance decreases, but the proportion of anabolic activity increases. This type of data um, can be a really useful way to start to generate hypotheses about exactly what's happening. And that's um, you know, certainly where we hope to go in the future, but these are some kind of previews of what could be going on. Quartz um, is a surface, of course, and a very pervasive one in these sandy salt marsh sediments, but um, they're relatively inert and could be um, kind of electrostatically um, repulsive to organisms that has been shown in previous studies and at least in a lab-based environment with cultures. Um, and the sort of ionic strength and relationship of these quartz grains with metals uh, could be playing a pretty big role. Reduced metals can be um, immediate substrates for iron oxidation. Oxidized metals can be uh, used for direct electron transfer. Um, interestingly, the, the actual mineral structure and shape and mineral lattice of that um, of those of those minerals is really important. Um, and especially in a natural environment, you're bound to have a lot of heterogeneity on the structural side. So I think that's going to be interesting moving forward in terms of how microbes gain a foothold and kind of how they um, you know build a positive feedback loop of metabolizing, kind of mining away some of this substrate and creating more uh, surface area and opportunities to attack that lattice structure. And finally, with reference to that uh, rutile titanium grain we saw, um, semiconductors have been shown um, to be sort of metabolically relevant. When light is shined upon them, they can produce electrons um, and just sort of in their native habitat, they can produce um, or provide electrons that can fuel growth on an anode. Um, so there's certainly a lot going on and some of these sorts of interactions are probably at play um, in the Sipuacet salt marsh sediments. I wanted to briefly touch on the, um, the immense amount of impressive work that Rachel was doing with the, um, the community analysis because this is kind of helping us piece together and bridge that gap between what we're seeing on the micro scale from the spatial relationships to who's there and what those individual organisms could really be doing. Um, and it tends to kind of um, reinforce those bigger picture trends I, I just talked about. So here we're plotting the alpha diversity statistics as we go down. So in each of these plots, we're starting at the sort of top layer of those sediments moving down into it. Um, the black dots are the bulk community, um, and then it's separated out by anabolic activity, the organisms that were uh, BONCAT active and BONCAT inactive. Um, so the yellow are the ones that were, were growing. And we see that as we go down, um, the richness, the overall kind of number of different uh, taxa decreases, but there is a kind of greater evenness among this community. That's true both with the bulk community, um, especially here it's uh, that the richness is going down, evenness going up, um, and then for the active subset as well, especially when it comes to the evenness of the community as it goes down. Again, this is sort of speaking to a more consistent environment that selects for organisms that are happy in that environment and can kind of more consistently um, grow and build new biomass. The um, this NMDS plot is sort of showing the beta diversity relationships and kind of confirming um, the, the importance of spatial relationships as we think about like 
predicting what the community directly adjacent to a given horizon is going to look like. So NMDS plots, um, for those who are unfamiliar, try to collapse the vast amount of um, diversity among these different microbial communities onto two axes. Um, and things that plot closer are more similar in their microbial community, um, both in the abundance and in the sort of phylogenetic relatedness among the different community members. So again, in the circles, we're looking at the cells that were not active and the triangles, we're looking at the cells that were anabolically active. So first takeaway is that they're, very, they're quite different, right? We really have an almost exact line separating the inactive community from the active community. This is sort of encouraging. It's telling us that, um, you know, things are not entirely random in this uh, environment, that some microbes are happy, some are not. Um, and that that no, no doubt changes with time and space and all of that. But also we're seeing that as you go down, the community sort of steps away from the preceding horizon. So um, we're seeing that the community at one layer is a better predictor of what's happening directly below or above it than something farther away. That perhaps makes sense, but it does speak to the kind of um, the sphere of influence idea of how different communities sort out in different horizons of the sediment. Uh, and I'm gonna end with kind of a, a slightly um, more specific look at what types of metabolisms we think are happening. Here, we're again going down into the sediment. Um, and with each of these types of, of lineages, we're plotting the um, degree to which they were enriched in the anabolically active fraction. So if they are yellow and move to the right of this, they were found more prominently um, in the active community. And if they're blue and to the left, then the opposite is true. So um, painting with broad brushes here, um, if we think about kind of sulfate reduction happening um, with the desulfobacterioles and um, sulfide oxidation, like the purple sulfur bacteria here with the uh, chromatiales. This is that pink berry uh, consortium that I showed you earlier on. And it makes sense that this is happening um, most prominent up at the top, especially with the phototrophic sulfur bacteria. As you go down, they're still around, um, but they're much more prominent in the inactive fraction. So this is telling us a few things. First, that um, they aren't entirely kind of consumed or um, you know, remineralized as they go down. They're still relatively prominent, um, but that they aren't actively growing. We can expand this to a number of other lineages um, and there's uh, kind of a number of interpretations that can come out of this. But again, painting with a broad brush, we're seeing kind of sulfur cycling and phototrophs at the top moving to a lot of um, sulfate reduction throughout this core um, that's probably taking advantage of that huge amount of diverse um, organic carbon coming in from, from the salt marsh. And then down at the bottom, kind of seeing a higher prevalence of uh, fermentative species as we get below um, the oxic zone. So those are kind of the, the two examples I wanted to share of, of this overall vision of trying to connect what's happening at the microbial community level um, outward as we move up and think about how these communities create these um, ecosystems and cause these huge kind of biogeochemical cycles um, that we're so used to thinking about. What specifically is happening on the cell to cell, cell to mineral scale, um, to allow some of these gases and, and molecules to transfer up and down um, in spatial scale. So this is uh, one way of, of doing it, and we're, we're really excited about it. And we think that um, there are some very clear next steps um, in terms of incorporating the kind of combining the who's there with the um, spatial mapping I showed you. Um, so building a lot of fluorescence in situ hybridization into this approach and hopefully getting at some kind of real-time uh, activity down the road. So uh, with that, I would like to thank some people who um, were directly involved with these studies. Obviously, um, everyone in the Gurgis lab was uh, so fun to work with. I've only listed a subset of people who were kind of uh, more directly involved with this work. 
Um, and Doug at, at the um, HCBI was super helpful with a lot of this imaging. Um, you know, embedded sand grains are not um, the typical thing that comes by the core facility. So he's very helpful in um, trying to, to make that work. Um, and then a number of collaborators uh, that I've kind of talked about throughout. I should mention that Amy Gartman um, did all of the XRD here and the interpretation of the, the mineralogy. Um, and then Mark uh, and Kun Young at UCSD were um, leading the sort of CT scanning components. Uh, I will stop there and would be delighted to take some questions. Dr. Marlowe, thank you. It was very cool. Of course. <laughs> and we have questions for you. We've got a little bit of a lineup here. All right, let's let's um, let's start with this question. Um, first, this, uh, our viewer says, great talk. And then they ask, in your sediment cross-section study from the little SIP or sip -a -wisset site, did you have any issues with your fluorescent probe sorbing to mineral services? Right. Um, so we did also um, do some um, some tests with kind of just the um, the cyber stains in cores that had been um, sterilized. So that was one suggestion that you know things were not kind of absorbing um, to the mineral grains too bad. We didn't section kind of as frequently as with the beads. Um, but yeah, the fluorophores themselves, we, we didn't specifically test, I would say. Excellent. All right. The, um, yeah, and I know that that's, a, um, that's always a challenge, right? As we deal with any kind of fluorescent probe uh, in a matrix like this. I, I do recall, though, that um uh that you know you did quite a bit of work in in normalizing uh or, or rather addressing that issue in a lot of the samples um that's a really cool topic i don't want to take us too far down this road but i that would be interesting for for um i would love to talk with you more about that jeff as you're you're definitely the microscopy expert um and i'm really i think it'd be interesting to think about different kinds of um, fluorescent probes and uh, their different tendencies to sorb and all that. But yeah, let's, I, let's, yeah I, I did just want to add also that, um, you know, we, all of our fluorophores were attached to, um, to dyes and probes of some sort. So we were able to test those and those were the complexes that we actually used. Um, so right. that in terms of relevance to trusting the study, I think is maybe the more salient point. The specific fluorophore molecules, um, you know, we didn't test and that could be a slightly different story, but that wasn't what, um, that wouldn't have created any sort of complicating information. Yeah, yeah right, great, great point of clarification. Uh, moving on, so we have um, a question. Do you know if the non-active microbes are dead or versus inactive during that incubation period? Yes, so that is a great question and, um, we don't know. So I guess the only constraint we have on that is the fact that they are still um, active by cyber green. So um, that's suggestive that there's still kind of a cell shape and a cell membrane. Mm -hmm. um, it, there could be extracellular DNA as well. Um, but no, we don't really know what the state is there. And that's kind of, that was the second part of, of the study that um, generated a ton of data that um, we're still hoping to hopefully uh, work on. But like, as you add in different types of substrates to the top of these cores, can you kind of activate a different subset of the microbiome? And, you know, all of these cells are there for a reason, you would think. So um, it's really just a matter of finding the right combination of, um, of nutrients and, and temperature and light and energetic availability that that makes different bits light up. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be mindful of the time here, so I'm going to uh, uh, condense these questions a bit. Um, do you see evidence for weathering around your feldspar grains? Because the the the, the viewer is wondering if clays might be part of the theory of why microbes are active on those surfaces. Yeah. So that is. Um, 
I completely agree that like the morphology and actual shape of these minerals is definitely an operative component. And that's not something we specifically looked at. We do have those uh, really quite high resolution electron microscopy images mm. where we could probably derive some degree of surface roughness, but that's after it's been cut. Um, so it's probably a little hard to back that out. Um, but yeah, I think that's certainly a factor in, in what's going on here. Excellent. Now, briefly, uh, our viewer is curious uh, th uh, that you also intend to check the activity under lab conditions, i.e. enrichment con uh, cultures, your ideas about mimicking the natural conditions and, uh, for example, volcanic samples. Yeah. Um, so there are no plans to do that at the moment. Um, but now that we have a sense in reference to the volcano and the fumarole of what those right. gases are, that is technically feasible. Um, we're really just hoping the next step is to kind of do the general, answer the general question of who's there to start with. So we do have a lot of frozen samples and, and we're looking forward to kind of getting a sense of um, what types of microbes are there in the first place and potentially um, through some metagenome construction, like what the sulfur metabolism is. I think the sulfur story there is going to yeah. be very bizarre. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, let's see here. Um, in wrapping it up, um, I'll just uh, say that some lab folk here have given you a little shout out saying we miss you in the lab. Uh, <laughs> miss you guys too. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and uh, we um, will end with the following question. Um, a viewer would love a brief introduction to the Ad Astra program and says that it sounds amazing. So take it away. Ah, well, that is very generous. Um, yeah, so this sort of popped up during grad school when some friends and I were kind of thinking about like why we became scientists and we all had a story of one pretty specific thing that did it. Um, for some people, it was like a really good movie. For some people, it was a teacher. Uh, for me, I had the, the privilege of seeing a space shuttle launch and that was just the coolest thing ever. Um, so we thought that, you know, motivation and wanting to learn is perhaps more than half the battle in terms of a, a kid's educational trajectory. And if we could engineer that sort of excitement about something in a very small amount of time and we kind of reproduce these moments, um, that that would be great. So we've tried to do something similar. We've had students in uh, Brazil and Bangladesh, Nigeria, um, Oakland, and hopefully soon Boston, um, where through kind of a series of field trips and then ultimately, a capstone project where they choose sites on Mars that a NASA spacecraft takes pictures of. Um, they're at the front lines of exploration and get super excited about, about doing this kind of thing longer term. Um, so we're tracking to see how it all goes, um, but it's just a fun idea um, that, that we think will hopefully bear some fruit down the road. I think it's bearing fruit already, Jeff, and you and your colleagues have done an amazing job with that. Uh, and also uh, an amazing presentation of, of this really exciting research. So thank you very, very much for your time. Folks who are listening in, definitely take, a, if you're interested in learning more about Jeff's work, uh, you can look him up at Jeff Marlowe on your favorite search engine and uh, check out his website and the cool stuff he's up to. So thanks.